we are live sir so good evening all of you uh, we are back with our second half of the second day i hope you enjoyed the first day and the first half so for the second half we have dr derek de souza with his presentation on ethics in research dr derek de souza is working in myanmar medical college talegao pune as a director of international bioethics curriculum implementation center and professor of dental surgery he is national faculty member at 3t bioethics training indian program on unesco chair bioethics haifa he is a consultant maxillofacial prosthodontist and professor prosthodontics with teaching experience of over 15 years he has written chapters in many books like patient safety protocols in handbook of patient safety published by fmc and specific learning objectives in handbook of introduction to medical education technology at fmc he has received many awards including chief of army staff commendation medal for distinguished service in indian army january 2010 and general officer commanding in chief commendation medal for distinguished service in indian army august 2014 we welcome you derek sir and please continue with your presentation thank you thank you karima for that very kind uh, introduction um will the screen be visible this way because it's i think it's no, will be, we'll be leaving sir will be leaving uh, so uh, so yeah okay that, then that's fine that's fine so uh, good evening everyone and uh, thank you for inviting me it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, one of my greatest joys and happiness is interacting with students and other faculty and we have a technique or we have a terminology that we use of each one of us being here as co-learners which we use in our national bioethics program so it's just a reminder that i'm not really here as a uh, someone to lecture you or to teach you but it's just to share our collective knowledge to share my experiences so far and at the same time i think i can learn from each and every one of you as well so with that uh, good evening namaskar and uh, we'll start with our presentation today next slide please you have you have the control acha i have the control with me great yes sir okay yes. so uh, just to see if everyone is awake and everyone is involved uh, just a small question for each of the participants who are here why do we research or why do you like to do research could we have some answers please just tell me why why would you want to do research or why would you like to to do a research go ahead like i said there's no right answer or wrong answer it's just a little bit of interaction before we start okay that's nice anisha to bring a change in the community solve a problem to know new things to make an impact improve treatment outcomes something new that helps upgrade ourselves help the people explore new things add information improvise that's nice gain knowledge and solve problems better understanding very nice to find answers to know our knowledge okay thank you i think that's that's a very nice uh, place to start but the reason that we should do research or the reason that we want to do research is to benefit our patients please remember that the fallout of research the benefits that we get out of research are just something that we get the benefit out of because we are doing it for the benefit of patients we are doing it to help the patients and then we get the additional benefits of promotions of being published of getting recognition of gaining new knowledge etc 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 
please remember this each and every one of you if the reason that you are doing the research is not ending up in a direct or a significant benefit to the patients then there is no point of doing the research then you are just doing it for your own purpose for selfish reasons may i say and that doesn't really bring us benefits and that is where research goes off track so i'll just share this beautiful painting with you it it depicts a very landmark occasion in the history of research and what we see here is a fairly well dressed person who's uh, quite aged trying to do something on the arm of a young boy who is being held down most probably by his father and another lady in the background appears to be quite concerned so that would be the mother of the child and in the foreground on the right hand side you will be able to see a lady who is bandaging her left uh, right forearm for those of you who may have guessed this actually depicts the occasion of edward jenner where he had injected a little bit of the pus from this lady whom you see towards the right of your screen the one who's wearing the hat and looking down she was actually a person who used to tend to the cattle and it was an observation by edward jenner that it was this class of people who were in close contact the milkmaids and the milkmen and those who tended to cattle that they did not suffer from smallpox which was ravaging the complete countryside as we are seeing in the pandemic here today and he thought that this could be related to the fact that these class of people the one who were tending to the cattle used to suffer from cowpox so he took a little bit of the infected material from that lady's hand and instilled it under the skin of this small boy and as the story goes he sat down whole night with this young kid waiting for his high fever to come down and by morning the child actually started recovering and this in fact is the very landmark in the control of infectious disease so today it would be quite horrifying and actually you'll find that no one will allow you to do this sort of research where you take infected material from one person and instill it into the other or something like you is normally seen in those hindi movies of old where you had the mother in the middle and two tubes running from each of her children on either side and she would recover a little later in the movie but yet this is the way that research was conducted and in fact uh, probably 50 years earlier to what edward jenner had done even condemned prisoners would be pardoned if they agreed to undergo various sorts of testing that is again smallpox inoculation so this is how research was basically conducted because at that time knowledge was definitely limited again looking at the powers of observation and how they came to find out what would be the cure for various diseases again you all would have read history and you remember that scurvy was something that took the toll on a lot of sailors because remember when they were sailing for many months they had no access to fresh food and because of that vitamin c deficiency they would suffer from scurvy and james lind recommended fresh fruits and citrus juices again the invention of vitamin c or the fact that it was actually vitamin c came in much later but it was just a simple cause and effect relationship that he was able to find out similarly jumping forward a few hundred years sir major walter reed who was an army surgeon he noticed that over 5000 of his troops of the soldiers died due to yellow fever whereas it was just less than 1000 who actually died during the battle itself 
and by his observation and his studies that he carried out he proved that it was actually the mosquito which transmitted the yellow fever and why we remember him still today is because he brought about the use of what is known as informed consent and protection of the subjects in research not only that he ensured that these forms were available both in english as in spanish so here you can see how he had made the wards for the soldiers you can see the use of mosquito nets in this painting and how along with his other fellow doctors he is monitoring the health of the patients under his care and this is a copy of the form that still exists in one of the museums so you can see how the name of that soldier is entered and you can look at how each of the present ethical concerns were covered where we talk about autonomy that is the patient was able to give his consent agree to joining the study he was able to participate in a voluntary fashion he was explained the risks the benefits compensation was very clearly given there and if you look at it and see a sum of 100 dollars in american gold and 200 to his family in case he died during the course of the study in 1900 remember was a huge sum of money not only that it also laid down the withdrawal conditions in case that person did not want to carry on and then came world war ii now apart from the rest of the political fallout what happened was the german doctors and here we see one of them joseph mengele who unfortunately was never caught or never punished and let me tell you his story again so that we understand the mindset and we can understand how easy it is for us to go wrong as well now joseph mengele when the time of the second world war and germany was reeling under the ravages of world war 1 he was a brilliant doctor and a researcher he had done his basic studies in public health community medicine what we call and then he was working under his mentor who was an expert in genetic studies being a brilliant young doctor he joined the german army and very quickly rose up in the ranks unfortunately he was injured in a grenade blast and he was sent to the concentration camps where his job was to decide which of the prisoners were able-bodied to work and which of them would be sent to the gas chambers because he had this power of selection the power to decide who would live and who would die and keeping in mind his background of genetic studies he began to isolate the twins and you can see all the children here so he had them separately isolated and again it goes to show that he would carry chocolates and sweets in his you remember in the movies they had those german army coats that they would wear they had huge pockets and he would carry sweets and chocolates in that and give it to these twins give it to the children and they loved him and they would come running around him and therefore they were willing to do anything that he wanted unfortunately because he felt that these were something who were worthless because they were jewish children you can see here for example he would carry out the most horrifying and horrific tests here he is administering some gas to one twin while keeping the other twin at the side and looking to see if there are any changes because at that point they believed that the twins were connected on a very deeper level apart from that a young girl who subsequently appeared at a trial you can see they've removed part of the fibula and they made her walk to see how long she could walk without any support or without any treatment the next picture you can see on the right is a person into which ice cold water is being injected into his veins and below that you can see the twins whom some of them you saw in the first picture look how ravaged their bodies are at the end of the experiments yet if you look closely you can make out the likeness in the facial features 
these are other german uh, jewish people they're being immersed in ice cold water another group was hung from the ceiling now remember all this was done because they said we are doing research we are doing studies to benefit our army soldiers and that was the time that hitler was planning to invade germany uh, invade poland and russia i'm sorry in the winter so they would carry out all these experiments to simulate what would happen to their soldiers and to be able to decide treatment plans for them now where it all went wrong was that they did not bother about the welfare of these people on whom all this research was happening and this is at the end of the war on december 9th when the american military tribunal was set up and the people that you see sitting in the middle row they are all there and they even now you can look at the expression on their faces there is no remorse there is no sadness and it appears that they are still quite proud of what they have done the reason for this is like i said they believed we are doctors and we were carrying out research and nothing wrong was done and in fact many of them never even bothered to feel sorry and they were ready to accept whatever punishment happened this was the summary given by the trial which said that the subjects were not given any chance to agree or consent to the experiment no liberty was there for them to decide or take part or not to take part the experiments were conducted with unnecessary suffering and injury and no precautions to protect or safeguard the subjects and most important all the subjects suffered permanent injury mutilation or either as a direct result of the experiments or because there was no follow up care so this is the indictment that the nuremberg trial put on all the nazi doctors and remember it was basically doctors and surgeons who were tried as war criminals and not really any of the generals or the others who actually took part in the battle now while all this was happening look at the duration of this study it carried on for 40 long years again carried out under the direction of the us public health service which is what the icmr is in today's india again the subjects here were all poor farmers sharecroppers who worked on the land without actually owning it they were not told that they had syphilis nor they were offered any sort of effective treatment they were just given a physical examination and all they were told what these are government doctors who are going to come and examine you for bad blood this is the outcome now some of you mentioned about getting knowledge about getting publications about being able to find out new cures so there were status reports and 13 publications in the medical literature which looks quite impressive but now comes the sad part 28 men died of syphilis hundred of related complications 40 of the wives had been infected and 19 children had congenital syphilis when they were born and this we have to remember that penicillin was accepted remember not discovered that happened around 1937 if i'm right it was accepted as curative treatment for syphilis in 1943 and the us public health service would be well aware of this yet despite all these facts they were not provided to the study subjects they were just allowed to deteriorate and again see what the long term effects would be in 1997 they were given an apology from president bill clinton and you can see in the picture the people sitting there they are all in wheelchairs because they are suffering from tertiary syphilis and 9 billion dollars was given as compensation but whether that will ever be enough is a debate for another day in 1966 henry beecher 
a researcher himself, brought out a very landmark article talking about ethics and clinical research. And he highlighted almost 22 examples where similarly questionable ethics were there in published research. And this laid root to the problem that not all research was conducted in the right way, or not all research was done in a way that would be ideal or would actually help the patients. Subsequently, the Belmont report came out, and this is the time that it started to lay out the ethical principles. One is respect, second is beneficence or giving a benefit, and third is justice. Despite all this, you find even in our present day century, in all countries all over the world, India is again not to be left out. And this is the most famous, this is known as the Indian Tuskegee scandal, where you find that cervical cancer research was done along with the top researchers from US and people from India itself. And unfortunately here, they had kept a control group who were just screened for cervical cancer and they were not given any treatment. And we know that once you are screened for cervical cancer or diagnosed with cervical cancer, keeping you away from treatment is the most unethical thing that any doctor can do. And yet this was done. And you can see the article was published in the British Medical Journal in 2014. Of course, it was subsequently retracted. And this is a reality. Even in present day, you find that researchers all over the world are still fabricating data. And again, there are too many papers being retracted. So this, remember, is after publication after peer review, which you have been hearing for the past two days, still there are studies that are not being conducted in the right way or in the manner that it should be done. OK. Uh, I don't think that video. Anyway, all right. So coming to what exactly should be done, I painted a rather bleak picture, I know, for each and every one of you. But let us be aware that all these people that I showed you did not start out as criminals or did not start out as saying, OK, let's do something unethical. They also had the right ideas. But unfortunately, somewhere down the line, they lost focus. They got so caught up in their research-minded look that they forgot it was human beings they were dealing with. They forgot the vows they had taken as doctors. And that is why all these studies went into the direction that they finally took. So what should we do? The first thing is we have to remember people who become part of our study are human individuals. And we need to respect that. And we need to respect their autonomy. Now, autonomy comes from two words, means auto and nomos. Auto meaning self, and nomos means the ability to take a decision or to take responsibility for one's own life and one's own body. And when people are sick or people are vulnerable, and we look at that a little bit later, their autonomy is reduced. Maybe they can't speak, or maybe they are too sick, or maybe they are in a coma to defend themselves. And therefore, we as healthcare professionals need to protect them. We need to understand, like I told you at the beginning, all research has to be done for the benefit of patients. So beneficence is one of the most important reasons, and probably the only reason in my book that somebody should carry out research. Not only that. During the procedure of research, the end results of the research need to be distributed equally and at a cost that everyone can afford. Otherwise, again, it is not justice. And above all, I've highlighted this most 
important principle of non-maleficence, meaning at all costs, please do not do any harm. So again, remember all your research participants, and remember this is the new terminology. We don't call them subjects anymore because subject means you are subjecting them to something. You are the one in power and they are under your control. No, it does not happen that way. The people who agree to be part of your research, to be part of your study, are equal participants because without their joining your study, your study would be useless. You could not proceed. So when they are participants, we need to look after them. We need to see that no unnecessary risk or harm is there. And again, most important, remember, the smallest number of human participants, the smallest number of tests have to be done, which will give you scientifically valid data. And this is the reason why those of you who have gone through your ethics committee, or sometimes you find your statistician, will ask you to calculate your sample size. So yes, there are scientific methods which help us to calculate what is the smallest number. And it's not something that I will decide of 100 or 200 or 1,000, because these numbers are easy to calculate in percentages. It does not mean I should do that many tests. It does not mean that I should do that many, uh, have that many participants. Only what is scientifically required, only that many need to be involved. So let's look at each one in detail because this is very important. Like I said, each person has their own autonomy. They can decide whether they want to be part of your study or not. And children, prisoners, like we saw in the beginning, a prisoner just because he wanted to be pardoned, or people who were farmers who were poor, they agreed to be part of the study because they didn't have a choice. So these people need to be protected, and we as researchers have the onus of protecting these people at all costs. In case there is any harm, that should be explained. And what is the expected benefit? We should not give them a false picture and say, oh, this is a fantastic medicine. This is something new, and it is going to cure you. That is not something that should be done. And therefore, they should join your research voluntarily and with complete information as well. Because ultimately, beneficence, it is our responsibility to look after whatever decision they take, whether to join, whether to leave, and wherever possible. When I'm planning my research, it is the research design that we'll see again and again, should maximize the benefit and minimize the harm. The reason why all the examples we gave you in the beginning went and have become quoted as things not to do was because it did the reverse. It tried to harm the people more than the benefits that could be accrued from the study. Now, when we talk about benefits, because again, this is something that people are going to ask you, that what is the benefit from the study? What is the benefit that you are going to get? So one is direct, which would arise out of participation in the study. For example, if there is a study now on the corona vaccine and the vaccine is a success, people who have taken the vaccine will get the benefit directly. Indirect will be that once you have participated in the study, and that medicine, say once again, the vaccine is approved, it's going to benefit hundreds and thousands. At times, it is an aspiration. So if you're going to try for a new test, or if you're going to try a new way which we can predict a disease, or we can predict the outcome of a disease, then that has an aspirational benefit. Or sometimes, if you're trying to find out the prevalence of the disease, for example, it's not going to cure someone, but you are going to try and find out whether this particular disease, what is the disease pattern, where is it more, where is it less. So that way, probably your community medicine or your public health people will be able to plan out programs for the future. So these are some of the benefits, and you need to identify these benefits and satisfy the institutional ethical committee, because this is the first question 
that you will be asked when you go with your research proposal. And coming to justice again, that once you have completed your study, as I said, you will get the benefits, whatever it is, whether you're with a pharmaceutical company or whether you're with an institution, and even if there's a medal or a prize and all that will come to you. But what about the results? During the study, are you ensuring that both groups of people are getting the same treatment? Are both groups of people not being denied necessary treatment or the minimal standard of treatment just because they are poor or just because they have come to you and they don't have an option of going anywhere? And finally, remember that all of us as humans are equal. So that's what it means by saying equals ought to be treated equally. Remember, it does not say rich and poor, haves and have not, nothing of the sort. Any person who is a human being deserves equal treatment. And in fact, many of the studies in the past used to be conducted in third world countries, such as Africa, India, and other impoverished countries where the population was more, the checks and balances were less. And what happened was the whichever medical drug or whatever treatment protocol was designed, that would be marketed in the West at a very high cost. The actual people who or whichever tribe or whichever group of people actually went through the study never ever got to see that medicine or it was too expensive for them to have or to buy or to even be given by that same company which conducted the research. And in fact, that's when the Supreme Court came down on the way that research was conducted in India. And today, you know how difficult it is to actually conduct a clinical trial. Not only that, during your study, you need to bother about the confidentiality. Now, remember, when a patient comes to you as a healthcare provider, an unknown person will come to you and he's going to come out with his deepest, darkest secrets. He's going to tell you about the history of his disease. He's going to tell you about things which very often someone would not even share with their wife or husband or children. The reason they tell it to you or the reason they confide in you is because of this relationship of trust. And again, when you are there as the researcher and you'll be collecting a whole load of information, you'll be asking them a lot of personal questions, at times maybe even embarrassing questions. So that information, once you have it with you, it is your responsibility to see that that information is taken care of. It should not be disclosed. It should not become ideal canteen gossip that you discuss it in front of other people. But it is your responsibility to have the data very, very closely monitored so that personal information is not revealed to others. So what are the risks that happen during research? Because if I understand the risks, then I can look at ways and means of how I can reduce the risk for my participants. So one, of course, is physical. So would there be pain? Would there be any side effects of the drug? During the animal studies or during the history or the way that the drug has been procured, is there anything that I anticipate? Is there any injury that is going to happen? Or it could be psychological. It could be emotional distress. Like you see today, the patients who are suffering from corona, most of them, the degree of anxiety is so strong, the worry is so strong because they are isolated from their families, from their loved ones. And they are under severe emotional distress, which may actually be more than the physical discomfort. Apart from that, there's the social stigma. Again, whether it's COVID, whether it's HIV, whether it's AIDS, whether it's leprosy, the person may not suffer from the disease rather than they suffer from the stigmatization, from social isolation, and the ways that society would treat them. Not only that, at times it could be economic. In case you have got someone admitted, someone is agreed to be part of your clinical trial and he loses his job because of the number of times that he has come to you, or 
if that information which was shared with you, say someone was HIV positive and he's working in your hospital, and if that information were leaked out from your research laboratory, he may be dismissed for no fault of his. So these are some of the direct or indirect harms that could be caused to your participants. And like I said, it is once again mandatory for us as researchers to ensure that nothing of the sort happens. So how would I like to conduct my research? Above all, protect your participants. Yes, research needs to be carried out. Yes, we need to test out new vaccines. We need to test out new drugs. We need to test out new techniques. But all the participants must be treated fairly and all participants must be treated with equality. So therefore, even when you're carrying out a clinical trial, you need to divide your subjects into two groups in a blinded fashion. So neither the researcher nor the person who is joining the group comes to know which group he is. So again, as a researcher, you cannot decide, okay, I'm going to put all the rich patients in one group and the poor in another group. Let me tell you, your results are not going to be satisfactory. And above all, this is not going to be ethical at all. So when I apply the research ethics, I have to understand that this is to govern the relationship that happens between me as the principal investigator and the participants. At the time of their registration, they should know that they can withdraw at any time. And as the investigator, I must understand that whichever way I look at it, I am in a superior position. I am in a position of power. And I should not misuse this power just because I am in charge of the ward I'm in charge of deciding their treatment, and therefore the participants feel scared of opening up, of confiding in me. It is not something that is ideal because they have to maintain this moral fiduciary relationship. Now, fiduciary means a relationship of trust, a relationship that is based on belief. So they have to believe that I am their friend, I am their well wisher. And only then will they confide, will they carry on in the study, and my results will be what are true and genuine, and not something that I decide what is good for me. So who's going to look at all this? And the reason in the past we saw that so much of the research, there was no proper monitoring of it. So today we have something called an institutional ethics committee. I'm sure all of you would have heard of this, or some of you would have even come before the Institutional Ethics Committee. And remember, it's a very powerful committee. They're going to overlook all aspects of the research. They're going to monitor your research very, very carefully. And they're going to help you see that your research goes on in the right direction. And again, I request each and every one of you to Google this new drugs and clinical trial rules of 2019. This is published by the Central Drugs Controller Authority of India, CDSCO. So it's a huge PDF document. Please download this if you haven't already and keep it handy with you and read it. Read it literally line by line. It gives you the complete background of research, how to conduct ethical research, how an ethics committee is formed, who are the members, what are the different types of the committees, all your doubts will be absolutely crystal clear. So please download this. I'll put it into the chat box, the link at the end of the session, so some of you can get it from there as well. And unfortunately, when you go before your ethics committee, at times this feels like they're just a series of endless speed breakers. And if this is the sense of what an ethics committee is doing, then how does research go ahead? How does treatment and benefit to the patients go ahead? But we have to remember that the ethics committee is not there as a speed breaker, but it acts like a guide. It helps you to ensure that you do not go off track. Like I said, they will ensure the safety of your participants is always at the forefront. 
They are never called even subjects. They'll ensure you maintain your ethical standards. You are implementing valid research. And even if the general public tomorrow has concerns regarding your research, this ethics committee, if they are doing their job properly, they are able to say that, yes, we are monitoring the research and we will ensure that nothing goes wrong. So the IEC, the Institutional Ethics Committee, reviews your research. They ensure that adverse events, if there are, they are recorded properly. Why that adverse effect event has happened will be taken care of. If it is happening often, they have the responsibility of even shutting down your study. If you have changed your protocol in between, and please remember any badly designed research is just not worth the risk. So remember, good research starts with a good study design, with good planning. And if you have good planning right from the beginning itself, more than half of your job is done. The rest of the research happens quite easily and in a very ethical fashion. So remember, the IEC, it has powers to, first of all, approve, disapprove, or even terminate whatever research activities are occurring under your institution. They can ask you to modify your protocol. They will ensure that all relevant information is given to the participants, not only before the starting of the study, but even in between, any new information has to be shared, proper documentation, as well as submission of timely reports. So they keep you on track and look at them as a guide. Look at them as somebody who's there to guide you and not somebody there to stop you, or like I said, as a roadblock or as a speed bump. And as we are coming to the close of this discussion, who is responsible for the protection? And even though I told you that the IEC has such a strong role and they will ensure that the participants are protected, please remember that it is you as the principal investigator. It is you as the person who has decided the research protocol. And in fact, each and every person, whether you are there as a student, as an intern, as a nursing professional, whatever your responsibility in the study, please remember that you are responsible for the protection. So if you see something wrong happening, if you come to know that a person is in trouble, if some ethical protocol is being changed, it is your responsibility to stand up for those people who do not have the power and look after them and protect them because tomorrow it could be your family member or yourself that is involved in the study. So when you are going through your research protocol, it needs proper scientific merit. Why are you carrying out the research? I told you it's not just I want more knowledge. I just want to try this out. It doesn't work like that. It should have a definite benefit and it should be understood what are the risks that are going to be there in my new study design, in my new drug, or in my new treatment protocol? And have I chosen my participants correctly? Whatever intervention or drug, has that been cleared at the proper level? Am I protecting the privacy and confidentiality? And what about the data that I have collected? A participant, remember, that would give the data for your study so he needs to be protected he needs to be given that importance because he's going to give you a lot of private information he is going to be an important person in your study and he needs to be given that much of protection and that much of respect and who will be your research participant it could be some of your patients it could be your office staff if you're just trying to find out about knowledge and certain perceptions, or it could be other clinicians who are working with you, depending on the aims and objectives of your study. And then we come to the most important part, what gives protection to all the participants? That is something called informed consent. And I'm going to read this out because each and every word in this definition is very important and I've highlighted a few of the words. 
So this is consent, that is meaning the yes that you say or the agreement that you enter into has to be given by a competent individual. Now, when I say competent, I'm talking about the mental competency for someone to agree. He has to be given the necessary information. He has to ensure that it is understood by the person and he must come to a decision without coercion, undue influence of any inducement or intimidation. So you can't take advantage of someone who is sick, of someone who doesn't have money, or you just give him a false pretense that you take this new drug and you're going to be cured. Remember, it's an active communicative process and it is the basic right of all participants. So here I have to tell the person what are the risks, benefits, any alternative procedures, answer all the questions so that he can actually make an informed decision. And this has a complete process. So one is disclosure, informing the person, ensuring that he comprehends, he understands, he agrees to join in a very voluntary fashion. The proper documentation is carried out. And above all, he is competent enough. So you can't take informed consent for someone who is very sick, for someone who can't understand your particular language, or someone who is maybe even too illiterate to understand what you are taking him into the study for. Are you giving sufficient information? Does the patient really understand your language? Does he understand whatever you're trying to say? And then does he agree or not having understood the risk and the benefit? It should always be voluntary. Like I said, if a patient is very poor and you're going to offer him 5,000 or 10,000 every time he comes, whether he agrees or not, is different he will be doing it because of the money and most important they can withdraw from the study at any time whether it is day one or three months or even a year after the study they have the right to withdrawal and you cannot blackmail them in any way so remember that there will be a patient or a participant information sheet which gives the background information it has to be there in writing it has to be there in a language that the patient understands. You, then you have the consent form on which the actual signature will be taken. And both these are integrated into one form, which is called the informed consent form. So remember, very often you'll hear people saying, OK, just get the consent signed. No, it is not just getting it signed from the person or from a witness, but it is a process you need to give the information and only at the end of the process is the actual signature. So the signature is a very, very small part. Like I told you earlier, that complete process of sharing the information is what is more important and which is going to protect you in the long run. So once again, to highlight the privacy concerns, keep your data very, very secure. Either keep it under lock and key records on your laptop, on a pen drive, on a flash drive, or if you're emailing someone, please ensure that any identifying information, of course, this is more important for diseases which are stigmatized, or for if it is information regarding your friends and colleagues as hospital or students, we need to be very, very careful of how the data is stored. And of course, you need to understand what are the state laws on privacy, because you may get into a legal battle with someone. So the concerns, when we are talking about comprehension, we are talking about it being understood. It should be in the language of that particular place and what is understood by your participant. It should be appropriate to the level of their education. So don't use too much of technical language. Don't write the actual name of fanciful tests, which the person will not understand but it should be as simple as possible. Again, remember, due to social and cultural issues, at times the participants may not ask you a question or may be too shy to say no to a well-known doctor or a well-known researcher. So keep this in mind while getting the informed consent done. For children, if the child is above seven years, apart from the parental consent, this does not replace parental consent, remember? 
you can also get an assent where the child agrees so similarly you need to explain to the child why he is becoming part of the study and what is his importance and both assent as well as informed consent should be got wherever possible just quickly a few examples of people who are vulnerable means they can be taken advantage of so we need to take extra care if the study is involving them those who are poor children women whether they are pregnant or whether they are in an institutional home or they are widows abandoned tribal populations of course sexual minorities need not be explained why you know how easy it is for them to be harassed and for people to take advantage those who are refugees or in disaster situations again like you have in the covid pandemic those who are in an institution orphans trials prisoners widows those who are elderly mentally ill need a lot of precautions when you are carrying out studies so be very very careful if that is your target group again those who are terminally ill so let me call my students we'll photograph them we'll get a publication done without thinking that it is a human being who is there at the end of the story and finally where there is a lack of power of if you're going to involve your students if you're going to have your employees if you're going to have service personnel for example in the army or in the police where they cannot say no again all these people need extra protection not to say that we should not carry out research on them but they need suitable protection above all integrity in research keep this in mind f f p because these are the common ways where researchers go wrong or where research data is falsified so one is fabrication that is you totally make up the results you just write or you put the figures which you feel are good and which show that your project has been a success again falsification you can increase or decrease the number of patients you can choose to avoid any untoward incidents that happen and of course plagiarism we all know especially in this world where we can so easily cut copy paste it's very very tempting just to take somebody else's result and to show it off as your remember these are all questionable research practices and it is up to us to ensure that we keep as far away from them as possible so why do scientists commit fraud one is just a hunger for scientific reputation like we saw in the beginning a few of the people said i do it for getting new ideas of getting new knowledge that is basically for self promotion it could be with a selfish desire or it could be due to poor moral or ethical character which we saw in the germans at the time of the second world war it could be due to job insecurities my boss is forcing me to do research whether i like it or not i have to take a research protocol so i'm going to do something with my students i'm going to do something with a group who can't say no to me it doesn't really work like that or if i feel that my ethics committee is not really looking into a lot of detail i can get away without being caught or i don't have time so i'm going to quickly falsify the results or finally it could be simply unhealthy competition two researchers trying to rush both want to get the recognition right now you know all over the world the biggest competition today is finding a cure or a vaccine for covid so we have to be extra careful and evaluate the results accordingly so coming to the end what are the principles that you keep in mind most important minimize the risk of harm ensure you have taken proper informed consent protect the whatever personal data ensure that your participants remain anonymized and their confidentiality is maintained avoid any deceptive practices to your participants to the research paper itself and even when you go for publication and above all give everyone the right to withdraw 
So what is the need of the ER? There's need for transformation. It's still not late. We are still good people. By and large, most of us are doing research for the right reasons. And therefore, there is an opportunity for each and every one of us to change and to ensure that we do the right things. Because if we have good thinking, if we have good planning, that gives us good attitudes and beliefs. That will translate into good behavior. And then we will see good and positive results. Those positive results will again get us back into better thinking. And this is a very positive cycle. This is the cycle that each one of us should look up to. So I leave you with this beautiful slide. It's just a summary of everything that we spoke about this evening, all the aspects that we need to keep in mind. And if all of this is surrounding us, only then can we have good quality research ethics at all time. And whatever research we do, that will be of the highest quality. So I wish you all the best on the journey ahead. And if there are any questions or any comments, we'll take it at this time. Thank you for a patient hearing. And I hope I've been able to do justice to this topic this evening. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for this very apt presentation. And working with the UNESCO Chain Biotics, uh, I have personally recognized the fact uh, that the science can no longer be built upon the sacrifices of the very thing that keeps us humans. That yes. is our one science. And uh, thank you so once again for giving us and our delegates this, uh, this wonderful direction while pursuing our research interests. Uh, with this, I'll uh, request uh, Kushi to kindly moderate uh, the question and answer session. For the yes, yes Sir, can we thank move you. on to question answer session? So, so the first question is, what do the students do if the college does not give IC? As we cannot do research without ethical committee, uh, how does a student from some college who want to do research but his or her college is not yes. encouraging him or her, how can they do and whom, okay. should, whom shall they uh, approach? Today, please remember it is mandatory that every college has an institutional ethics committee. So remember, as students, you do have a lot of power. So you can all get together. You can walk up to your principal. You can walk up to your administration. Remember, you are asking for something which is genuine. You're asking for something which is just. So tomorrow, no one can deny you. You can always walk up. You can make a petition. And you can say that we would like to have an institutional ethics committee. And therefore, we need to have this in mind. Like I told you, I have uh, already told you the link. You can go for the new drugs and clinical trials 2019. Download this PDF document. At times, what happens is your institution is unaware of how to go about it. Please remember, we are all human beings. So let's give them the benefit of doubt. So possibly download the document, read it yourself, go to your principal or go to one or two of the faculty whom you feel are sympathetic or who will be on your side. Allow them to read the document, make up the proposal. And let me tell you, it's not something very difficult. We've gone through that process ourselves in our own college, better late than never. And I'm sure a lot of colleges will start this as well. So all you need to do is follow this document. It guides you absolutely basic point to point. So I don't think you'll have a problem. So once you start that, it may be difficult for you, I realize, or it may delay your own research. But at least you'll be setting the ground or you'll be setting things right for the future batches. Again, agreed, worst case scenario, it takes time. You don't have your institutional ethics committee. Please remember that you can still carry out research. You could still carry out collection of data at your end as long as you are doing it with the right principles in mind. So for example, you can simply do things as observing people on hand washing or observing the patient relatives and how they interact. Do they understand? Maybe you can just interact with the relatives of patients who come out from the OPD and ask them simple things. 
Did you understand what the doctor told you? Did you have any queries? Were you given sufficient time to ask your questions? And using that information, you can come out with your own study. You can come out with data that will help your institution. And like I said, as students, as interns, you do have a lot of power. Even again, if your institute, if your head of the department is not willing to listen to it, you as interns can get together, you as students can get together and decide that, see, this is how we are unable to fulfill our duties. This is the lacunae that the patients are feeling. And therefore, let us change. So that will bring about actual change on ground. OK, you may not have a publication yet. You may not have a great name yet. But you are able to change. You are able to benefit the patients at whatever level you can. So there, there is no uh, big or small point in research. You don't have to do something very great. You don't have to find a cure for the most difficult disease or the most rare disease. But in simple things, in day-to-day -day practices, that is where we lack. That is where you can start collecting data. And remember, again, like I said, keep the data anonymous. If you have to, you can collect data on your patients. And maybe when you go in for your post-graduation, or maybe a couple of years down the line, once your institutional ethics committee is up and functioning, then you can use that data. In India, remember, and all of you all would have seen, we are very, very poor at data collection. We are very, very poor at utilizing the information that we have. So even if nothing else, get used to the idea of collecting data again in an ethical manner. Ensure that the patient privacy and confidentiality is maintained. So just by collecting the data, looking at the data, analyzing the data, that will guide you as to how you can do research in the long run. And when you get the opportunity, you can take it to the next level. Thank you so much, sir. So a second question is, what if the patient yeah. withdraws at the peak of the research? Should we try to convince them? And if not, is there any kind of agreement so that yes. the patient a doesn't withdraw in between the process? Very relevant at times. The agreement is that the patient can withdraw, period. He does not need to give you a reason. In fact, that is the basis on which, like I told you, the patient is protected. His autonomy is protected. He does not need a reason to withdraw. OK, so you cannot stop him. Ethically, you should not try and convince him. But from a reality point of view, and I realize there are certain practical considerations on ground, what you can do is you can find out why does he want to withdraw. It could be some uh, simple thing as he has to move. Or maybe he's finished his education. He's got admission somewhere else. And that is why he wants to leave. So that you can do ethically. You can find out as to why do you want to withdraw from the study? Why do you suddenly want to leave this study? Leave it. Are you having any problems? Did somebody misbehave with you? Is there some side effect? So if there is something that the participant is hiding from you, you will come to know. If it is for a genuine reason and you feel you can find a solution for him, you can still enroll him as the participant. For example, if he can just take the medicine, you can say, OK, <coughs> excuse me, I can courier the medication to you. You just take it on the prescribed time, and you email me, or you send me the blood reports as and when you will do it. So he will continue to be part of your study, even if he is not physically in your presence. And you can tell him, OK, Maybe once in six months or once in three months, of course, depending on your study design, he can come and visit you. Or even if you have the funds, maybe you can sponsor him to come once so that he continues to be part of the study. Like I said, it depends on how important each participant is. Again, possibly what you can build into your study design is a 10% fallout rate. So if your study requires a minimum of 50 participants, then you enroll about 55 or 60 of them so that up to 10% will be lots to follow up. And accordingly, you design. Say if it's a study on end of life or patients who are suffering from advanced cancer, 
what is a reality is that some of the patients may expire before your study ends so you may need to recruit more so it will depend on your study where you are carrying out the study how long is the study design there have been studies which have gone on for 25 years 50 years on on heart diseases as the framington heart study all would have heard of that so that is carrying on for a very long time because it's a follow-up study so it depends on the type of study and plan this into your design plan this into your protocol and like i said get to know your participant understand his problem most people are rational and they would have a valid reason for why they want to leave the study if you can find a solution to that they will definitely continue thank you so much sir so the last question for today is how is ethics approval given to studies conducted uh, in private have clinics private institutional ethics committees which will give you the approval required so these of course they do it at a cost and of course you will have to go and approach them request them to come they will probably come and examine your setup they will see that you are following the protocols very strictly and again an easy way of getting around this because sometimes it's difficult to uh, most of these private or independent ethical committees they do exist especially in the bigger cities but they are quite expensive because like i said they do it as a business and secondly they take their job very seriously because again they are monitored much more stringent than an educational educational institution or a medical college for that matter so they will take their job very seriously they'll ask you for a lot of documentation they'll ask you for a lot of reports and as a private practitioner you'll have to see that you can agree to all of that a shortcut to this or an easier method to do this is try you can tie up with a faculty from a medical college or a dental college or nursing whatever the faculty is required from a college and use them to get the ethical committee approval by making one of the faculty as a co-investigator and then you can carry out the research so that it's easier to get the research from the ethical committee again it's good for that faculty you can also get the resources from that hospital to help you out and you can add your own patients into that and put all the data together the focus or the reason for you doing the research i keep coming back to it again and again like a broken record that it is benefit to the patients if i can keep that in mind that my study or my desire to do this research is to benefit the patients if i keep that as the central focus everything else falls into place uh, sir i believe the, that is the end of the question answer round yes yeah. and uh, ayush so thank you so much. Thank you, Shiv, yes, and the entire team. Fantastic job. I hope the response has been good. And in case there's any positive or negative feedback, Shiv, you can please share with me. Like I said, we are all here to improve and learn. So uh, you can share the feedback so that we can uh, add or remove in future as to whatever they felt from this. We'll do that. And thank yes, you for all the support. You, and it's been great meeting all you guys and uh, all the best for the remainder of this and uh, please do carry out so uh, these sort of conferences and interaction i think this has become the new normal and all of us need to look for this i'm sorry i took a little bit of extra time with the questions but it's always good to share and to learn from each other so yes, thank sir. you so much and thank you so much grateful for being given this opportunity to interact with all of you thank you thank you sir. thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you.